Good evening, everyone. I declare the meeting open at one minute past six. On behalf of the City of Vincent, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and we pay our respects to Elders present, past and emerging. Um, just to let members of the public gallery know that we do web stream our meetings, and we do record and publish them on our website, but we do not include the public question time part of the meeting. Um, in terms of apologies and members on approved leave of absence, we do have a few council members absent tonight. We've got Councillor Susan Gondoshevsky on approved leave and Councillor Ros Harley and Councillor Matt Buckles as apologies for this evening. Um, we'll now go to public question time. So this is your opportunity to address council on a matter on the agenda this evening. Um, there's no particular order. It's just as you um, approach the microphone, um, first come first served and you're able to speak for up to three minutes, we do just ask that you state your name and the agent, your address and the agenda item which you're um, speaking to. So could I have the first speaker for the evening please, if you just come up to the microphone. Um, if you are joining us on the live web stream, we welcome you to the meeting this evening. We're um, holding our council briefing this evening, which is where council members ask questions of um, the directors and staff about items on the council agenda for next Tuesday night. Um, what uh, we might do is just move to the items in which we've had questions from the members. Um, oh, my apologies. We have to actually, first of all, take declarations of interest. So I'll just take um, the CEO's comments on that. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, I only have one disclosure of interest, and that is from me in relation to confidential item 12.1. The, uh, the nature of the interest is a direct financial interest as the matter relates to my performance and remuneration in the role of CEO and my contract of employment with the city. Thank you, CEO. So if we go to questions on items in the order that they were raised by the public um, this evening. The first item is item 5.2, which is number 404 Newcastle Street, West Perth, change of use from warehouse to unlisted use, motor vehicle repair shop, and this is a retrospective application. Are there any questions in relation to this item, councillors? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of, or Acting Director of Development Services. Um, the report referred to a number of measures around addressing noise and emissions, uh, such as keeping the garage door shut during operating hours. Can I just ask about what some of those other um, measures might be specifically around emissions as opposed to the noise? Um, for the emissions are, in t oh, sorry, through the chair, um, the emissions issue is also intended to be addressed by closing the rear door, um, but I can take the on notice and check if there was any other um, measures that were proposed. Any further questions, Councillor Lowden? Uh, two queries through the chair. The first one, um, uh, Sam uh, just spoke earlier about the complaint uh, that was received that it was actually due to the street, street sweeping business not directly resulting from his activities. Are you able to confirm if that's the case from the city's perspective? Um, it's actually Peter Reeves. Oh, Peter. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I've got Sam. Sam said. Um, through the chair, we have some um, ongoing compliance investigations occurring in relation to a number of sites near lot 404, um, so can't provide any additional details at this stage. My second question was just around, when we investigated in 2014 and 2016, we didn't realise that it wasn't properly uh, zoned at that time for, or approved at that time? Uh, that's correct. The development application was triggered in 2016 as a result of the investigation that we undertook at that time. Councillors, um, I just wanted to ask a question in relation to whether there's been an in-depth discussion with the applicant about the management plan and the requirements and whether there's an, a full understanding of the extent 
of, of those obligations and potential costs to the applicant. Is that something that the applicant is aware of and, and is prepared to, to honour as part of these conditions? Um, as far as I understand, yes, that discussion has been undertaken and the applicant is willing to work with the city to um, develop the um, management plan that will address the issues um, and all costs associated with it. Thank you. And just also in relation to um, where the complaints have come from, is it possible to provide um, council with some information about the location of the objectors and the sites that would be potentially impacted by any noise or emissions? Uh, yeah, I'll take that on notice and provide it in the briefing notes. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, just if we can get some, um, apologies if it's in the report, but some indication as to why it's taken more than 500 days between the application date and coming to council, that would be great. Thanks. Through the chair, um, I can provide a timeline. I know we've done that in the past as to the um, liaison that we've had with the applicant during the time that the city's had the application. So, and just um, further, I'm not so concerned, well, I'll speak to it next week, but the, the complaints, um, my understanding, has come from the properties to the rear, not from Harwood Place. Is that correct? That the complaints that have been registered? Are you talking about Harwood Place? Where no, I'm talking. This is adjacent to Harwood Place. Harwood Place. It just happens to be nearby oh, right. the next Sorry. application. So. <laughs> Sorry, um, but I, I, what, what I'd like to know is when the uh, multiple dwellings to the rear were constructed, uh, if, if that's possible. So that I think that they are listed as being on Fitzgerald Street officially, I think, or they may be on Car Place. But if we can get, uh, if we can find out when they were constructed, the properties that are immediately behind, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Sorry, through the chair, I understand that they were constructed around 2009, but I'll confirm that. And I understand that the complaints were um, that the city's received have been received from um, the um, units directly abutting this lot. Okay, and if we can also then just uh, find out if they would have had a section 70A on their uh, notified on their title about um, uh, which was usual at the time in relation to construction of multiple dwellings and that it may be impacted by noise, et cetera, from commercial activity within the area. That would be great. Just also to follow up on that question, um, Acting Director, um, in relation to the noise complaints, Peter Reeves has said that he'd be interested to know how many complaints there have been, and there does seem to be some confusion around the complaints being associated with this business or with um, the street cleaning business or with other uses in that commercial um, hub, is that something that the city is able to clarify or when the noise complaints come in are they sort of generic complaints about noise from the area and is the city having to work through and decipher where those noise sources are coming from? Uh, in, the, in this instance the city received two complaints and um, they were just general in terms of the, the lot because there's a number of uses occurring on the lot and so in this instance the city then investigated where the complaints originated from. So just to follow on, so you're saying two complaints have been verified of being associated with this particular business, but that's the extent of the complaints? Sorry, just to clarify, they've been associated with the lot more broadly. Thank you. Council members, are there any further questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on to the next item that was raised, which is item... Uh, 5.3. Item 5.3 relates to 452 to 460 William Street, Perth, change of use from shop to tavern. Mm. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Acting Director. Um, can you clarify a couple of queries from the floor? Um, has any of the previous, I guess, owners, tenants had to pay cash in lieu historically for this site? Through the chair, my understanding is that there's been a, a number of um, uses at the site since it was constructed, um, you know, maybe a hundred years ago. We don't have the details of all of those as their um, historic applications. I understand that no cash in lieu has been paid for the site up to, to date. Um, the applicant also asked whether they could access the complete comments. Um, actually, I'm wondering if I can just 
I might list a few questions and that might be easier. Um, whether they can also access the calculations around the shortfall. Um, why taverns were exempt from waiving cash in lieu, um, and then some from me. Um, whether there's been any consideration around parking restrictions on Wade Street. And the report refers to cash in lieu payments being made to contribute to the provision of or upgrade of parking facilities. And just wondering, do we actually have any in mind what that might look like in the future? Um, you know, where additional parking would be added in the area or what changes might be made to facilitate that? So through the Chair, I'll just go through those um, questions as you ask them. Um, in relation to the specific objections that the City received, um, unfortunately we can't provide those. We can only provide a summary of the submissions, which we um, have done through, so through the report. Um, we can provide the calculations, so I'll take that question on notice and we'll work with the applicant um, between now and the council meeting to provide those calculations to them. Um, with regards to the question about taverns and why those are exempt from the policy requirements, um, or why they're, sorry, why they're um, exempt from being able to, council being able to waive the cash in lieu, um, in 2015, Council adopted amendment, an amendment to the parking and access policy, which provided guidance on the types of applications that um, they would waive the cash in lieu requirement, and taverns and small bars were specifically exempt, um, so the cash in lieu requirement for those under the policy can't be waived. Um, Perhaps I could provide some explanation sure. on that, Steph, because that was a decision of Council and the reason that Council made that decision was um, where, where you're seeing a change often from, for example, retail or office to small bar or tavern. It's a much higher intensity use normally um, with uh, much less daytime activity and activation and what we're experiencing in our town centres at the time when we were making that decision, if you think for example of Beaufort Street, we were seeing a lot of change of use from shop to small bar and that was pretty much um, having a big impact on the daytime economy. So that's the, that was the basic reason around why um, cash in lieu waiver wasn't going to be considered, as well as the fact that given it's a higher intensity use, normally we're talking about small bars which are 80 um, people or taverns which are traditionally above 80, um, there's a much um, greater demand for car parking than there would be for a, for a shop or office use. So that was the basis behind that decision and it was really looking at examples of say Beaufort Street where we were seeing that emerging and the impact that that was having on the town centre. Um, so through the Chair, just following on, um, in relation to restrictions around William Street and specifically Wade Street, um, I understand that the City introduced some restrictions around uh, in the William Street area more broadly in July, um, but I'll take that on notice in specifically in relation to Wade Street. Um, and unfortunately I missed the last question, if you could please repeat it. Sure, it was just in relation to, I guess the rationale for cash in lieu payments um, is to provide funding to then address parking issues into the future. Um, so through the Chair, the City is currently developing a plan to um, spend the cash in lieu that it collects and that will include um, identifying projects in the William Street area. Council members' questions? Council Lowden. Um, just uh, <clears throat> on the topic of cash in lieu through the Chair, um, given that Council can't waive cash in lieu, do we have the option to um, reduce the cash in lieu and if so, how would we go about doing that? Through the Chair, um, Council still has the ability to waive um, a portion of the cash in lieu requirement or re reduce the, the fee that's charged. Um, in this instance it isn't recommended, um, predominantly because the assessment that's been undertaken on this particular development application takes into into account factors um, like the heritage um, listing of the building and um, that's included in the adjustment factors um, as well as the policy requirement and so in this instance it's it's not recommended that that, that, um, that, that happen. 
Councillor Lowden. And uh, the, the, current, the current use of that site as a shop, um, how many car bays would they be required to provide if this was a new application under its current use? Uh, I believe that it's 1.3 bays if it was a shop. Um, thank you, Councillor Lowden. That was a question that I was going to ask about. If you looked at the existing use and the fact that there is no current car parking, is that something that could be considered um, as a potential discount on cash in lieu in terms of the fact that it's operating as a shop without any car parking currently with a car parking calculation attached and um, what the difference would be between the existing use um, at, on that basis and the required car parking for the new use? So um, in terms of this application, we would look at it on its merits against the planning framework that applies um, right now, notwithstanding that there's a current use uh, occurring on the premises. Um, so in that regard, we would need to be satisfied that the policy objectives um, of the parking and access policy were being met. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, I've just got a couple of questions um, in relation to noise management, so condition four and potentially condition five. So um, in the event that there are complaints about noise during the hours that are proposed under the current condition four, what would be the assessment of whether those noise complaints were valid or not? What would be the process to, if somebody com rings and complains and says uh, that there's too much noise at 8 o'clock at night, I'm trying to go to sleep or I work night shift, whatever it is. What's the process by which that, that noise complaint would be investigated and on what basis would it either be substantiated or otherwise? Um, through the chair, it would be investigated in the way that all noise complaints are investigated by the city, um, where we would attend the premises, take our um, noise measuring device there and determine the level of noise that's coming from the facility and um, whether that complies with regulation or not, and then work with the, um, the owner, operator and the um, aggrieved resident to um, resolve the issue. So my question is, why would it be any different at any other time of night, and why do we require them to go to the expense and trouble of an acoustic report if we were treated in the same way during the hours that we approve, regardless of what they are? Why can't we just let them open, assuming they will have no normal noise uh, attenuation uh, measures in place, and if there are issues, we would work with the applicant in the same way? I mean, to me, it's a strangely... Well, I won't speak to it because I can't, but as a question, why are we making them do it if all we're going to do is attend on site and say there's been a noise complaint, what are the issues, and we're going to address it? Why are we making them go through a report process to be able to get extended hours if we're happy with those hours on the basis of the report being submitted? So through the chair, um, the noise regulations provide guidance on the times of day when um, the more stringent requirements apply. And so that's the reason why the 10 p.m. Um, close time has been recommended in the condition um, to comply with those noise, the guidance provided in those noise regulations. More stringent requirements apply between the hours of 10 p.m. and uh, midnight. And so, if um, to be able to meet those requirements, it's recommended that they provide an acoustic report demonstrating that they're able to before we provide um, an approval. Okay. And the last question relates to condition. Uh, six, the cash in lieu. If the policy explicitly says that they can pay it off over five years, why, we, why do we require as the condition that it's prior to the commencement of use rather than saying prior to the commencement of use or uh, via, and I can't remember the clause and didn't pick it up, but um, as, as mentioned, as explicit explained in the policy, the option to pay it off over a five year period is available? I'll find the clause in a sec. I'll just have a look too. So through the chair, um, if you have a look at the advice notes that are in uh, attachment six to the report, it provides information regarding how they may enter into an agreement with the city um, to pay off the cash in lieu amount over the five years. Um, so, which, so which, I, which I, I just, in terms of the, the condition itself, if the condition is yeah. to be valid, it should be based. I'm, I'm asking the question. I know that's how we have been doing it recently, but previously we had always given the option of either paying it, 
paying prior to the commencement of the use mm -hmm. or paying over the five year period as an option. Through the chair, that option is still available to them under the condition as it's currently worded, as I understand. Uh, it's, it's, so it's not, but I will just foreshadow that I will seek to amend that to be explicit that that option is available as within the condition so that it's not, because um, it currently says prior to the commen commencing a yeah. use, the cash in lieu shall be paid to the city based on, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't specify any other option. Uh, just following on from the Mayor's question around um, the cash in lieu component, if um, the, the current use had gone through a development approval with a 1.3 bay shortfall and had, they would likely have been required to pay cash in lieu unless they got an exemption and then if we'd gone and then this had, uh, application had come up with the 6 bay shortfall, would we have deducted the 1.3 original cash in lieu from it? Through the chair, yes. Um, I do have a series of questions. Um, in, first of all, just in relation to the um, the limiting of the of the opening hours to 10 p.m. Um, on Friday, Saturdays, I'm just I do have some concerns that that's quite restrictive in an area that will be. Um, part of a district centre under TPS2 and I just wondered whether there was any consideration given to at least allowing um, op you know, operating hours indoors to midnight on, um, on the weekend nights. Also something that I think is not often considered as part of these applications but perhaps we need to turn our minds to is where we have um, Sunday opening hours but we have a public holiday the day after whether we need to factor in a 12 PM close on a Sunday where it's followed by a Monday public holiday. That's something that often comes up after an approval. Um, so just a question about whether we could look at at least giving indoor hours till midnight um, prior to all of the acoustic reporting being satisfied. Um, I also just wanted to ask a question in relation to the cash in lieu. Is the applicant seeking a 50% reduction, which is what seems to be um, that stated in the report, but tonight there seems to be an indication of a full waiver. So if we could perhaps get some clarification during the week. Um, and I'm just, when I, when I look at the plans and you've got the separation of um, retail area and storage area with 70% being retail, I'm just wondering what uses do bottle shops operate under within the city of Vincent and is um, a calculation of the entire space as tavern um, having an impact or is the cash in lieu being um, factored around the, the patron numbers? Is it floor space or patron numbers in this, in this case? And do we need to consider the fact that 70% is a retail component with 30% being patrons? Um, I'll take the first three questions that you asked on notice in regards to working with the applicant um, throughout the week to get clarification on what they're seeking. Um, the last question that you asked regarding the patron numbers, it is based on the patron numbers. So. Um, Councillor, are there any further questions on this item? Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, just... And it's hard to ask it as a question, but I will do my best. So the so clause 1.4 of the car parking policy where it talks about existing shortfalls says, after multiplying the car parking requirement by the relevant adjustment factors, the total car parking requirement may be further reduced by any existing car parking shortfalls for the site, except in the case where parking shortfalls have been granted under clause 2.4. And then clause 2.4 talks about the waiving of any of the requirements. And the last part of that says these provisions do not apply to any change of use applications to tavern or small bar. However, the end of clause 1.4 does explicitly talk about change of use and removing that adjustment factor. So just if we can be sure that we are clear whether a tavern use would actually have that 1.3 under the old policy previously, any existing shortfall was able to be applied over the site, however historical it was. And so I understand given the 100 year history, there may, well, there may be some approvals that may well have fallen under that. And we should look into that, but just if we can get some accurate information about those requirements, that would be great. Um, councillors, any further questions? 
Councillor Murphy. I did. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. So, um, with the if there was TPS two came in and it was classed as a district centre, that wouldn't make any impact to the parking requirements, would it? Because it was it's. I just wanted to double check that. Um, through the chair, under TPS2, um, the use would still be considered a tavern use, and so therefore the policy requirement in the parking and access policy would still apply as it currently does. Sorry, one last question. Sure. If we can also get um, information about any cash in lieu collected by the city on William Street between Brisbane and Newcastle in the last, say, well, whatever you think is reasonable, five to seven years, something of that nature. Um, does any, any cash in lieu that's been uh, collected and paid by businesses on that street for either change of use or new builds um, in recent history, that would be great. Any last minute questions on this item? No, moving on. Okay, the last item raised by the public um, this evening um, is in relation to um, 1 to 16 of 17 Harwood Place, West Perth, change of use from multiple dwellings to service apartments. This is an amendment to an existing approval. Council members, questions? Councillor Murphy. Um, just in response to uh, some of the gallery concerns, I wanted to know what um, avenue the city might have to adjust the CCTV cameras to um, focus more on the outside. Um, through the chair, as far as I understand, they're not the city's cameras, but we may be able to work with the applicant to adjust where they're f filming. Would we make that a condition of approval then? We may do, but I'll take that on notice. Yeah. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Acting Director. Are you able to comment on, I guess, how would we monitor the condition around the um, staffing times um, to prevent the leaving of keys in boxes for people to collect? How would we actually assess whether that occurs or not? Um, through the chair, the intent is that um, the reception desk be staffed by um, a member of the organisation during scheduled check-ins and check-outs. Um, so that, that would be specified through the management plan as well as the condition that's um, part of the approval and the city would be able to um, take compliance action if they felt that the um, applicant was in breach of the management plan or the condition and the condition. Council members? Yes, Councillor Tuppleberg? So, just um, so uh, the applicant's representative spoke about some of the complaints being unsubstantiated, and whilst some of what's been mentioned are clearly police issues, I think it's imp we have a responsibility to be able to substantiate some of those because they seem quite harrowing in terms of some of the incidents that uh, have occurred in, in proximity to the proposal. So, are we, um, are we able to? Look further into some of the issues that have that have been raised, and just be able to affirm whether, if, I mean, if, that, if the advice is given by uh, to somebody whose home has been invaded, that the likely scenario is it has come from that premises, and that advice has been provided by police. I imagine there's record of that somewhere uh, that we should be able to access, and not that it necessarily impacts the decision. But I think that it's if those substantiated complaints are there, we should um, potentially present them as part of as part of the supporting information. Through the chair, um, the city has only been advised of um, the complaints that are referred to in the report, with um, 16 of them, I understand, being um, parking issues and the city staff attended to um, infringe those parking outside of the restrictions in the area. Um, and there was one complaint that the city received in relation to noise at the site, um, but during the phone conversation, um, the noise ceased and so the complaint um, didn't go any further. Um, the question regarding the police matters, I'll take that on notice and I think that we'll be able to provide some more information in the briefing notes. Councillor Loden. Just on the uh, compliance with the management plan, talks about a 30 minute response time. So if um, a complaint is lodged um, and that time frame is not met, what 
what does the, the steps look like, I guess maybe in a bit more detail, for the city to take in that, in that situation? Um, through the Chair, I'll take that on notice. Um, look, I've got a few questions. I think the, the issue for me is that we're hearing one thing from the applicant, another from the residents, and there's a few issues that I just wanted to check in terms of things like the pick-up drop-off area and the conversion of the visitor bays into the pick-up drop-off area. That was actually a condition of approval from 2016, but my reading of the report is that that still hasn't happened. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but I'll take that on notice and confirm. So the other, some of the other issues raised is that um, Alison has raised that she doesn't believe that there is actually a, a reception desk in the apartment um, in this short-term accommodation building. Is that something that the city is aware of existing or not existing? Uh, that's correct, and that's the reason why this application has been lodged to amend that element of the current approval. Um, but the current approval was to have a reception desk in place to be um, monitored 20, well, to have an officer present 24 hours. So there's not, is, is it the case that there's currently no reception desk? That's correct. Um, also, we've heard tonight that there is a lockbox key code and um, there is actually not on-site check-in and check-out happening and that that's referred off-site. And we've also heard that um, the management um, contact numbers have not been provided to residents. So um, we're, we're imposing, we're seeking to, I'm just trying to establish, we're seeking to impose things that, ha that were already required that haven't yet been imposed on an application that was in the first instant ret retrospective. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and has the city investigated um, the building to to test these things, or is this is I mean, in terms of knowing that the um, that the on-site check-in check-out isn't happening happening, there's no reception desk. Is that has those sorts of factors been brought to our attention through an inspection by city's officers? I'll take that on notice and provide a response in the briefing notes. Um, and also just in relation to a couple of questions that Councillor Harley, who's not able to be here tonight, she did email some questions through, just in relation to the one strike users being prohibited from staying at the service departments again. Um, is that something that's contained in the body of the management plan? And also no more than six persons may stay in an apartment at one time. Is that is that detail? I think that was previously required. I'm just wanting to check that that's that's still um, part of, will be still part of the management plan? Uh, the intent is that that remains part of the management plan and I'll confirm that that's the case. Thank you. And just further, in relation to the 24-hour CCTV, I'm just wanting to get a bit more clarification about um, who, will, who will be monitoring that CCTV um, and what is the response plan. Um, and also it would be good since uh, Councillor Murphy has raised this and also from some of the comments we've heard tonight, what span of coverage does that CCTV have in terms of the building and, and the um, immediate area at the front of the building? Um, and also just in practice, what is the intention around the coverage or span of hours for the check-in and check-outs? Um, is, it, is it something that's going to be ad hoc on a daily basis depending on who's checking in that day or are we looking at having some kind of at least daytime regular hours for check-in, check-out presence on site? Uh, with regards to the CCTV questions, I'll take those on notice. Um, my understanding of the um, condition in relation to the scheduled check-in and check-outs is that they could occur um, on an as-needs basis. And just finally, sorry, Councillor Murphy, come to you next. Just finally, given that some of the complaints are of a very serious nature in relation to drug use, prostitution, deals, damage, aggression, um, taxi pickups happening from at three to four a.m., um, are we able to approach the police to um, to? Um, I know that there are issues around police providing detail, but we do have good relationships with our local police stations. Is that something that we could investigate further? given that the sort of seriousness of the complaints that are being raised with council? 
uh, yet we'll see what we can get. Thank you. Councillor Murphy? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was just going to add for those security questions as well. It does mention in the management plan that it will be managed by 24 hour security, including vehicle, vehicle patrols and walkthroughs. Can we actually get um, some more specific information on how many vehicle patrols, when they are, will be patrolling, um, what the walkthroughs um, are, and how often they will be occurring, and at what times? Thanks. Councillor Hallett. Just last one. Um, and can I just ask about the, how many beds are in each of the apartments, with, given that we're saying there's six um, people? We'll take that on notice. Some are two bedroom and some are one bedroom. I do know that, but I'm not sure of the bed configuration. Councillor, no, no further questions? Okay, we'll move on from this item. Um, but we're just going to go to community engagement items. Our director has a um, very significant personal commitment to get to this evening, so we're going to go to those items first. So um, if we can just move now to item 8.1, which is sports ground fees and charges review. Uh, are there any questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Loden. Uh, apologies to the other councillors. I miss, missed the uh, councillor workshop on this item. Um, with the proposed recommendation, just wanted to clarify about um, if the rebates are also available um, to sports uh, organisations that meet the certain uh, KPIs that we're looking for them to achieve so that they can actually reduce their, their rates? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Uh, the approach that administration has taken to all of the, uh, the five options that were shortlisted as part of this review um, all have the ability for the rebates to be applied. Um, unfortunately, with each of the different charging methodologies, the financial impacts um, for the clubs vary, no matter what the option is. So uh, some clubs will realise a, a financial increase and some will achieve a financial decrease. So um, the ability of the, the rebates, um, one, enables the city to um, encourage the clubs to, to work towards what are some council and administration objectives, but importantly for those clubs um, who will be financially worse off um, under any given option, the rebates enables them to, uh, I guess, seek some parity back to a similar level of charges that they're currently got. Uh, we haven't gone into detail into the report around exactly what each rebate will look like. We've given some um, advice around what we think are the, the primary areas of focus in the first instance, for example, increasing junior membership, um, reducing a reliance upon um, revenue from alcohol sales, um, but importantly, um, working towards uh, performance indicators within our RAP or in our DAPE. Um, so that's something that rather than being prescriptive in the Council report, we saw more fit uh, depending on the option that Council um, prefers to go to from a fees and charges perspective. We would then clarify the details around the rebate, communicate the, that to Council prior to implementation of the fees and charges. And just to follow up on that, because um, I take your point about some are better off and some are worse off, um, do you have a sense of what, if they did achieve all those KPIs, their cost would be? And is that something you'd be able to include in the report somehow so we can see that if someone is achieving their objectives, whether or not they'll be better off financially or worse off under these changes? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. We, we have um, mapped that out for each of the different options and to give a bit of an understanding so that... I guess overall, rather than club by club, this, the city is currently attracting um, around $45,000 in fees and charges through the sports grounds. However, we know from analysing use over the last 12 months that uh, it has not been administered, administrated correctly. So what we should have been um, attracting in revenue was around um, $60,000. So uh, with the proposed introduction of the standard per player charge, uh, the overall revenue would be about $32,000, $33,000. So we know that uh, 
there will be a decrease in, in revenue for the city overall. Um, some clubs will, will receive a reduction, some will receive an increase, and we can certainly provide some more finite detail in, in, in probably a tabular format for each of the different options to, to see how that um, does impact club by club. But the, the challenge we had is no matter what option we go for, some clubs are worse off and some clubs are better off. Um, so that, that's going to be an outcome regardless of the preferred way to go. Just to further follow on, so I'm looking at attachment for the standard per player charge. Um, the final column, potential financial implications to sporting clubs, has those various um, impacts for those, each of those organisations. Now that's that's a, an undiscounted cost, isn't it? Yeah. So you'd be able to provide, say, an extra column that says if they achieve everything, this is what their financial potential cost would be. Is that fair? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can provide that advice. It was, uh, there are a number of quite complex attachments, so uh, we, we drew a line in terms of what information we were providing, but um, we can easily provide that within the briefing notes. Uh, through the Mayor, to the Director of uh, Community Engagement, just um, an add-on to the stuff around the community objectives and the rebates. Um, I know that these are examples only. Um, so I just wanted to check in, A, about the ideas around reducing uh, revenue from alcohol sales and whether that could also include things like alcohol sponsorship um, and moving on to other things like uh, junk food sponsorship and, and other stuff. Um, but then also, at what point do you think we might um, specify some of this with more clarity for the clubs so that they can also build into their planning for the following year um, to try and achieve some of those objectives? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, again, regardless of what option um, Council seeks to move forward with, the, the implementation of this is, is absolutely essential that administration does it correctly. First of all, uh, we don't unfortunately have a good track record in administering the sports grounds management and associated fees and charges very well. So we need to communicate with the clubs what has been happening, uh, what the fees and charges methodology is moving forward, and then work with them over a, a number of seasons um, to get the fees and charges at the appropriate level and educate them around how the rebates will work. Um, certainly a, a linchpin to making the rebates work is the sporting club health checks. For example, uh, the, the alcohol uh, revenue per annum, we will only know that on a year-by-year -year basis by seeking and obtaining that information from the sporting clubs themselves. So the, the comparative data will be, for example, their alcohol revenue or their alcohol sponsorship last season compared to what it is this season, and that will be what we use to demonstrate whether they have reduced or increased their reliance upon such revenues. So there is still a significant amount of work for administration to do once uh, this fees and charges methodology is agreed upon by Council, so implementation is going to be um, key from an administration perspective. So just one follow-up. Um, in terms of the health checks, um, to what extent will they be, I guess, privately provided to the clubs versus will there be opportunities for clubs to kind of benchmark against each other and try to outdo each other in terms of achieving some of those outcomes? Through you, Mayor Cole, it's certainly the, the main reason for our, our health checks is to actually get some data on our clubs, for the purpose being so we can start to develop some trends around uh, membership and good governance and those sort of things. So I would like administration or the city more broadly to be in a position where we can generally share the trends amongst our sporting clubs. Uh, for me, that's a second step. The first thing is we, we just don't know enough about our clubs at the moment in terms of how many members they've got of those members, how many are juniors, how many are social, how many live in Vincent, how much money has the club got. So I think that base level data is our first priority, but certainly understanding the trends thereafter is, is, is certainly an important next step. Um, just in relation, Director, um, about rolling this out and how we're going to talk to the clubs about it and particularly for those who um, potentially will be paying more. What's the sort of consultation strategy around that with our clubs? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we recently held our first um, club development 
or club forum, for want of a better word, which was just a first introduction of our community partnerships team to our sporting clubs. Unfortunately, uh, there has not been enough communication between those clubs, and the reason why we held that a couple of months ago was just to start that forum as... as informing the clubs that there is now a regular communication forum with them. Um, so our intention is to hold two club forums, one for our summer clubs and one for our winter clubs. Um, we will always try to not make it dry, so it won't just be about fees and charges. We'll try to bring some, a guest speaker or something um, uh, to attract the sporting clubs in the first instance. But that is um, really the, the starting point to communicate how these fees and charges will work um, and where clubs uh, are worse off, how the fees will be transitioned in and how the rebates will assist them in achieving some good objectives for the community, but importantly, assisting them with defraying some of the financial impacts. So uh, we, we have mapped out the implementation um, strategy for this and it will be season by season, starting with the summer season. Thank you, Director. So when you talk about rebates, obviously those, there's the rebates that, uh, in the report, but if you're, for example, looking at a club where they're going to be experiencing much higher fees than they currently are, are you talking about a rebate that's a sort of transitional arrangement that over time that they work towards paying under the new system? Is that, is that envisaged as part of this proposal? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, definitely. There, there are a couple of clubs in particular where uh, the existing fees and charges have not been administered anywhere near enough to accurate. So, um, for example, some of the clubs at Britannia Reserve um, have been charged uh, for one team, whereby there's four cricket fields at Britannia. So straight away they should have been paying four times as much. Um, now it's not realistic to go from paying $800 a year to $3,000 a year, um, but we need to educate the clubs about this is how many players you've got, this is how many fields you use, under our fees and charges, this is what you should be paying, but through a combination of a transitional introduction as well as uh, the club accessing some of those rebates will at least enable them to plan over a couple of financial years um, for that financial burden. Thank you, Director. I'd definitely find a table um, highlighting those changes per club very useful if, that's, if that work can be done. Are there any other questions on sports ground fees and charges? Okay, no, we'll move on then to the second community services item, which is the purchase of a um, digital camera for marketing and communications. Any questions on this item? I didn't think so. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> okay, thank you, Director. Enjoy your evening. Okay, we'll go back to the beginning to the items that we haven't yet covered in development services. So the first item is 5.1, Shop 20, um, number 148 to 158, Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne, change of use from consulting rooms, non-medical, to alternative medicine consulting rooms. Any questions on this item? No? Okay, that was the last development services item for the evening, so we'll go to technical services. Item 6.1, Hyde Street Reserve, um, proposed extension. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, the officer comment on page 128 in relation to the dog area says the park will continue to be on leash only. Uh, it's actually dogs prohibited within the park currently. So just get some clarity as to whether the intent is to allow, because the question that was asked was whether people will be technically in breach of our regulations if they walk through from uh, Alma to for or from Forest through to Alma or the other way. So if we can just get some clarity around that, please. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll follow that up and get an answer for you. I think the CEO has something to say on that. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, through you, just uh, as a point of clarification, my understanding is that the comment was raised in respect of the new park area to be created, not to the existing park, and the officer response um, is that dog access is or is intended to be permitted. So if the question is, or if the suggestion is that if dog access is currently prohibited from Hyde Street Park or Reserve, then that same prohibition should be applied to the extended park area. Uh, administration will, will look into that if that's the point that's being raised. 
Otherwise, the scenario would be that theoretically half of the park could be dogs on leash and the other half would be dogs not allowed. That's fine. I just I think the clarity is being sought is people are walking their dog from Forest Street to Alma or in reverse, are they in breach of our... If a ranger was on site and they would have walked their dogs through, are they in breach? Uh, because the, there are people who are quite protective of not having dogs in that park currently. Councillor Loden and then Councillor Hallett. Uh, just a quick one around, um, was there a consideration of planting any additional trees in the Hyde Park area? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, you mean as in Hyde Park, as in that? <laughs> Sorry, Hyde Street Reserve. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I think one of the comments was, can we have a large shady tree or larger shady trees? And that was the officer's response as well, that they will be planting a large variety of tree to create more shade. So yes. Um, and do we have capacity to um, do some monitoring around traffic flow um, around that area post development of the reserve? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that's yes, we will deploy the traffic classifiers in both Forest and Elmer Road to measure the impact either side of what was Hyde Street. Councillor Tuppelberg, did you have a question? Just, uh, just in relation to the, if we can get some indication of the location of the trees, because one of the things that was asked. Uh, when we did the eco zoning uh, under the current swing set with the removal of um, some of that green space that you, can, you one of the, that you can't kick a footy in the park so just if we can get if we're going there's not that much space to put large shady trees so if we can get some indication of what would be there because I think part of the idea of if we look at what's been promised in the promise list and the size of what we're doing there's quite a large shady tree uh, we've got nature play areas uh, and also somewhere to kick a footy there's not that much room that we're creating to be able to do all of those things uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll ask um, the parks people to nominate a location for the proposed large tree to ensure that we keep some open space. Thank you, because we do know they were disappointed when the lawn was removed. So, But sitting under a nice shady tree would be great. Um, I just had a question in relation to the report talks about the road closure going to public notice, then request to Minister for Lands, notification to service authorities, emergency services, affected residents. I just wondered if I could have an estimation on the time frame before we're actually able to close the road once we satisfy all of those um, requirements. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, probably the people that lag the most are the service authorities. So probably at worst a couple of months but we can certainly try and chase them up. So I think two months maximum, OK, subject to a bit of pushing. OK, great, thank you. Any further questions? OK, I just also just want to let members of the public gallery know that we have asked all of the questions in relation to the development services items. You're very welcome to stay. I just wanted to make sure that if you were waiting on any further progress in relation to the items you raised tonight, um, that won't happen now until the council meeting, which is the decision-making meeting where debate happens. Um, but please don't, I'm not trying to push you out the door, you're very welcome. I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Thanks. Okay, I'll move on to corporate services, which is item 7.1, um, review of policy 4.1.26, risk management. Any questions on risk management? No, okay, move on to item 7.2, lease of 4 View Street North Perth to Multicultural Services Centre of WA. Councillor, Councillor Toppelberg. Um, so just, uh, I've never, or I'll ask it, I've never seen a lease written before where the option is at the, uh, the lessor's option rather than the lessee. Uh, is that something that we're, we're even able that we're even able to do because it's, I thought the option, an option period is generally the lessee's option uh, where it, this is effectively giving a one year lease and we'll consider another one year lease on the similar terms thereafter. It's not giving an option because the option is not at their discretion. So just in terms of the language and what the actual document looks like, it, to me it reads like we're offering a one year lease and saying that's it pretty much because we're not giving an option because it's at our discretion. Through the chair, certainly there's nothing preventing the city from granting a lease with an option period where that option is exercisable by the owner of the facility, so the city. So um, certainly in this case, yes, it is lawful. 
Um, and we've provided it that way to highlight that they have um, assurance that the city is not going to lease it to anybody else over the three-year term and that the three years with the one year with one year with one year is there to provide the city with the opportunity and the flexibility in the event that we are able to progress some of the um, studies that need to be undertaken in terms of the common um, project, etc. So it is to provide the city with the greatest flexibility, but we are entering into a lease that provides two one-year options that can only be exercised by um, the lessee with the council's approval. So we can't lease it to anybody else. So they have that assurance at least. Um, also, I just had a question. Sorry, was someone else next? Councillor Hallett? Councillor Hallett and then Councillor Loden. Apologies. Go ahead. Um, just in relation to the, there's a comment around potentially repainting um, being required by the lessee. Could I just clarify, what are the obligations for lessees in terms of maintenance um, and why is that kind of put onto um, people who are essentially using space that we own? Through the chair, it's a normal lease provision that the lessee would be responsible for painting of the facility, particularly if they have a long lease. So in this instance, there would have already been built into their current lease that requirement. But again, whether it's been painted um, in recent months, it may not have been. Um, so we're certainly leaving the discretion to admin that obviously if we um, plan in the future to... Um, demolish the building, um, then we wouldn't be requiring them to paint in that instance. Councillor Lowden. Um, one of the comments in the report talks to how the rent covers the, the cost associated with it, including the depreciation on the asset. Um, the additional rent that we earn above and beyond the general costs of just paying the outgoings of the building um, where does that fund, does that just go into general revenue or do we allocate it into like the asset sustainability reserve or something like that? Through the chair, revenue from leases generally goes into consolidated. Should we be allocating these cash flows into the asset sustainability fund given that their, um, those assets are depreciating over time and we will eventually need to use those funds to pay for upgrades? Through the Chair, the likelihood that lease payments are sufficient to meet the asset renewal cost is, is very unlikely. So it's a whole range of financial scenarios, but um, we would, if, if we don't put it into consolidated, then we will have to raise, well, if we were to put that money into reserve for a future expense, then you might well find that you're required to raise more rates for immediate expense. So it's a, it's a balancing act, but certainly in terms of the moment, we have no policy that would suggest that we should be putting rent into the asset sustainability reserve particularly until such time as we have a better handle on what our long-term asset renewal costs are, and that may well be one of the future strategies implemented in future long-term financial plans. Councillors, any further questions? Okay. Yes, Councillor Toppelberg. Um, just so two more questions. One relates to the rent. So they, they did... Uh, the email that was sent on the 22nd of September which basically said they were agreeable to the terms other than the proposed rent um, and were seeking a reduction in rent based on the reduction in commercial rent generally uh, from when this was last uh, attained and we've, we're essentially going back and saying we'll charge at the same rate it's currently being charged with CPI increases. Has that been agreed to or is that just what we are proposing uh, to go back to, uh, as a result of council decision because it doesn't seem to have any subsequent correspondence? <coughs> Through the chair, the proposal that was submitted to the lessee was that it was $17,000. Um, 
Um, the proposal that's in front of council is actually that we retain it at the current level um, and increase it by CPI when it would have increased by CPI had they been on their current lease. So uh, we haven't gone back to them and um, proposed that we don't reduce but we don't increase. That will depend on what council's decision is. Yeah. Okay. That's. I'll deal with that separately. And just so, just for clarity about the terms of the lease, so contained within the lease document is an obligation on the city not to lease it to anybody else for a period of three years. But whether those options are renewed, obviously, is at the lessor's request. But then they need they need consent at each of those two option periods. But that. We, we, but we are precluded from refusing to provide uh, a continuation and then leasing to somebody else. Through the chair, the, the intent of the lease, and I may have to take on notice and read through some of the normal sorts of conditions, but the intent is certainly that we're entering into a one plus one plus one with the lessee, but the exercise of those options will depend on the progress of the current studies. So certainly the intent is that we would um, approve those extensions if they request them, uh, providing we don't need to use the site for another purpose. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next corporate services item, which is termination of 7.3, termination of lease and options for future use at 245 Vincent Street, Leadable. Questions on this item? No? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, just in relation to... Um, this was, uh, there was a few questions and issues raised last time that this came to council and I just wanted to clarify um, on the basis of the discussion that happened at the last council meeting, would it be possible to go ahead with the residential lease while um, EOIs for sale were, were um, sought and would that be either a six month um, residential lease or a 12 month, would a 12 month residential lease be appropriate? Through the chair, um, for the city to rent the facility out as a, for residential purposes, we'd need to fit out the kitchen. So there is an expense that the city would need to incur to um, get it uh, ready to be rented. Um, so again, council will just need to consider whether that's good value to um, spend that sort of money on a six month or 12 month um, lease. Um, and again, I guess by the time a month um, lapses, by the time we get a, a resident in there, etc. So a lot of it will depend on whether that term would be suitable for a resident as well. But certainly it's going to come down to the cost benefit. Thank you. So I've got two questions on time frames. I'm wondering if I could get a time frame on um, on the whole EOI process from commencement through to sale, if that was to happen. And I think I've made my views clear on that, so I'm not advocating for anything. I'm simply asking a question. And uh, secondly, I wanted to know what the time frame will be on the broader strategic assessment of the city's land holdings. At what time will we, at what sort of time frame will council be in a position to have that broader strategic assessment? Thank you. Through the chair, in respect to the first question, um, page 153 provides a timeline or an estimated timeline in terms of what uh, the, the steps that would be involved in going out to an expression of interest and bringing a report back to council. And so we'd be aiming to bring a report back to council for the December meeting. In respect to the second question, I'll have to take that on notice.
So, so you're saying it would come back to council in December and then from that point on it would be a relatively straightforward transaction? Bringing the report uh, through the chair, bringing the report back to council would then depend on what decision council made. If council, because this is a disposition under section 3583, should council decide to sell or lease and either of those options were not um, exempt, then we would then need to advertise that disposition. Um, that would need to be advertised for a minimum of two weeks um, and reported back either to council or under a delegation of authority. So that there is a time sequence that would be required to finalise that transaction, whichever decision council made, or if it was a decision not to follow up with either of those, uh, the outcome of the EOI and revert back to the um, residential rental, then we would just proceed with the refurbishment. So effectively, would that be a three month sort of delay in in residential lease if the decision was okay now we're going to go to residential lease so that would would that be the sort of maximum loss of time on on residential leasing uh, through the chair yes so if we if the council decision in december was to not proceed with any of the submissions and we were then to initiate the works necessary I wouldn't expect to have a resident in the building until January. Sure, the CEO. Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, just a couple of points I would add further to what the Director has mentioned, and that is that there would be nothing preventing Council from running the two processes in tandem. Um, there would be no reason that the officer recommendation could not, for the most part, be acted upon to authorise, uh, firstly, to agree to the termination of the lease, which is first and foremost what has triggered this report, then to um, undertake the actions identified in recommendations two, three and four for the purposes of um, expending some money on the property to improve the kitchen to make it habitable in order to attract a residential tenant, then leasing the property out on a residential tenancy for, for example, 12 months if Council felt that that was a sufficient period of time to recover the cost for investment in upgrading the kitchen. And then in the meantime, while the tenant is occupying the property, pursue the EOI option if Council was of, was of a view to do so, because what that would simply do is buy more time for administration to assess and for Council to consider and determine a way forward if that way forward upon receipt and uh, evaluation of the EOI responses is anything different to what Council may have otherwise resolved if it chose to put a residential tenant in. Um, and just in relation to the Mayor's uh, second question about a time frame for a broader strategic assessment of the City's land holdings, that's not something that I can foresee occurring within the next 12 months. Um, it's not currently an item that's listed on the adopted corporate business plan um, for any of, from memory for any of the uh, upcoming four financial years. It's definitely an, a body of work that would need to be done. Uh, it is strategically uh, important and significant enough to warrant inclusion on the corporate business plan. So I think that's something that I'll take on note and uh, consider for the review of the corporate business plan as a body of work that needs to be factored into um, administration's resources for the coming years. Councillor Loden. Um, if council was to proceed with the upgrade of the um, property and, and proceed to rental, as um, the CEO outlined, and then proceed with an EOI, um, is it reasonable to assume that all, if not uh, most, if not all, of that cost of upgrading the kitchen would be recouped in the sale of the property, given that it's probably going to be used for a residential purpose? Um, and then my second question is, is it also reasonable to assume that we would recoup the costs of that installation within about three to four months, given the eighteen to twenty-four thousand dollars of rent that we're expecting? Through the chair, uh, the in response to your first reasonable assumption, 
but again, um, hard to anticipate what proposals may be received. And um, again, as the sooner we can get somebody in there and renting, and if they're renting at the appropriate um, price, then yes, it's a four or five month return. Any further questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Murphy? Uh, I'm just interested to know if uh, an EOI was pursued, if there would be a caveat that de developers couldn't um, apply. Uh, developers need not apply. I'm not sure if that is um, appropriate or uh, could be possible. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I think it would probably be in the best interest of the process if that was taken into account in the assessment of the submissions. Um, having said that, if Council wanted to expressly um, invite or encourage or even prohibit different categories of you know, prospective landowners or users of that premises, then that's Council's prerogative to do so. Just considering the discussion's gone the way that it has, can I just ask through you, Madam Chair, either to the Acting Director of um, Development Services or the CEO to explicitly um, explain or to explain what uh, the provisions of being listed on our MHI as a Category A property uh, prohibit or what the protections are that are afforded to the property of being a Category A listed and also what, if any, other practical differences between being on the State Register or on our own register other than the fact that decisions are made by this council. Um, uh, Acting Director, are you happy to take that question? Sorry, can you just re can you just repeat the question for me? What can people what can people do or not do with a property that's listed as Category A on our MHI? Basically, is the question. So through the chair, um, the use of the site would be determined by what it's zoned. Um, so they would just need to maintain the heritage elements of the property. Yeah, so they would be able to have residential. Mm -hmm. Could they demolish it? They would need to seek approval um, from the city to remove um, the listing, the, the property um, from the heritage list if they wanted to demolish. Just, just to be clear, that's a separate process to, an, to a DA for demolition. That's actually a process to there's a separate advertising process for removal from the MHI. That's correct, but they could. Do potentially do both concurrently if they if they saw fit. CEO, uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, question to the Manager of Approval Services, Paula. If you know, given that it's a Category A listing under our MHI, does that provide protection against the um, deemed provision of the planning regs? that came in a couple of years ago that enable demolition to occur without the need for approval. My understanding is that the Category A classification would prevent automatic demolition from occurring, but can you confirm or clarify if that's the case? Um, through the Chair, um, as I understand, it would, um, as it's listed as a management Category A, um, the deem provisions don't apply uh, and uh, they would require approval um, to demolish. But we could provide some additional information through the briefing notes. Are we ready to move on from this item? Yes, okay, thank you. We'll move on to 7.4. Lease to um, Axicom Proprietary Limited for telecommunications purposes at uh, Tamala Park. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Loden. Just to clarify, so we own one twelfth of this and then does that revenue come back to us or does that get held by Tamala Park? Through the Chair. Um, so it's, Minda it's actually within the Mindari Regional Council area. So this lease is directly between the, 12, the, the seven landowners and the lessee and the revenue is received by the seven landowners. So yes, we would receive one twelfth of the $70,000. Okay, 
councillors. Um, just one question is around the Tamala Park landfill coming to an end at eight years. I imagine there's going to be nothing that can really happen on that land for some time, um, but just the fact that, that will, um, this 10-year lease will go longer than the uh, projected lifespan of the Tamala Park tip, has that been factored into the consideration? Through the chair, um, I would have to take that on notice, but um, if I took, uh, as I understand it, the Mindari Regional Council leases for a substantial period longer than the landfill operation because of the remedial um, works that are required at the end of operation, so um, I am presuming it's been taken into account, but we'll take that on notice. Any further questions? No, okay. Uh, moving on to 7.5, financial statements as at 31st of August 2017. Any questions on this item? Yes, Councillor Toppleberg. So just questions through you to the Director of Corporate Services. Um, when can we expect our review of the reserves, the reserve funds, their purpose? Uh, what's, and yeah, was, we, I, my understanding was under the CBP we were looking this year to remove those that were superfluous and redefine those that were a bit wayward, but do we have a timeline for when that will happen? Through the, through the Chair, we were anticipating that um, through the long-term financial plan process we would have been able to have a clearer understanding. We didn't quite get there this year, but we're certainly hoping that as part of the review of the current long-term financial plan that we'll be able to have a clear understanding in terms of our demand for funds and therefore the, uh, the funding sources required for that, which would include the reserves. Any further questions? Um, Director, I just wondered if on notice I could get a little bit more information on the transport revenue being down 210000 and the lower expenditure in the recreation and culture area of $1.23 if you could perhaps provide. Oh, we've got something here now. Uh, through the Chair, um, uh, I did check the transport revenue and that's actually parking revenue. So the parking revenue is a little seasonally down at the moment and I'll need to check on the expenditure side. Thank you. So just in terms of seasonally down, that's a common pattern and we should see that come back up or is uh, previously we have seen a bit of a downturn in parking revenues that... Um, are we still thinking that we will reach the um, budgeted amount? Through the Chair, I'll take that on notice. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to uh, authorisation of expenditure for 24th of August to 22nd of September. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Corporate Services, can I just clarify... Um, a couple of payments, and I guess a bit more detail about what they are. Um, there's a few payments to Beaver Tree Services, um, and in particular there's one for almost 250000 um, on the 13th of September, um, which I believe is about a week after the Mary Street incident, and so just wondering if they're related or not. Possibly to technical services, actually. Through the chair, we'll take that on notice. Um, yes, Councillor Hatton, also just to clarify that my understanding is that there will be zero payment made for the Mary Street trees. So that's um, been communicated to me by the CEO and by the Director of Technical Services. Um, so just to clarify, yep, go ahead. So I guess assuming that that's for something else then. Um, and just also, um, could you say a little bit more about the payments to Cot Gunning for prosecution services and employment advice? Whether, is that EBA related or, or something else? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yeah, we can provide that information. Councillor Hallett, do you have anything further? Any further questions? Okay, no, we'll move on to... Uh, uh, the investment report, 7.7. .7. Any questions? 
No questions? Okay, we're moving on. Councillor Loden does not wish to ask a question. <laughs> Um, in relation now moving on to 7.8, which is review of the Local Government Act submission to Welga. Councillor Hallett. Um, I noticed in one of our recommendations in our submission, um, there's one around a register of senior salaries um, to be established. I'm not aware that we do this ourselves. I'm just wondering whether the council or admin have discussed this at Vincent level before. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I haven't had a chance to check our website, but yes, it's previously been discussed, and the explanation that was provided uh, to Council previously, and from memory, the information is actually on our website, is um, senior staff who have salaries within particular salary band ranges, which is just the information as per reported in the annual report. So my recollection was that that information is on our website. Yes, in the governance tab. tab. Um, I might have missed it, but I, I was looking at that tab today and I couldn't see it on, on there. Um, and just in terms of the support that we've set around pro uh, prohibiting donations from developers to local government election candidates, um, is there any appetite for this to be expanded to sitting councillors and mayors? And does donations include gifts? My understanding is that if anyone is running for an election, they're a candidate, so that would cover you, whether you are a um, sitting or, or someone who is an existing member of council or not. Is that perhaps a question for the manager? But that's my understanding that a candidate, you're a ca candidate regardless of whether you are sitting on council at the time or not. Yeah. Just to clarify, I guess um, sitting councillors not in election period, so just gifts from developers to in the regular business. Um, does anyone wish to respond to that? So just generally receiving gifts from developers as opposed to at election time, yep. Sorry, through you Mayor Cole, can I just clarify what the question actually is? I guess whether, just, whether it's been discussed at all um, within admin and what the feeling for admin would be to expand um, that recommendation. So, Jonathan, if you, which recommendation exactly are you referring to that might, that might help pinpoint it a little more? Um, I don't have the number. It's specifically the one around prohibiting donations to election candidates. Um, it was in the um, second part of the documents, so the ones that Vincent specifically was passing. Um, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the only comment I would make on that is there are quite, quite extensive gift disclosure requirements that already apply to council members and staff. Um, they are not personal to the nature of the individual that gives the gift, so everyone is treated identically. Um, we prepared a flow chart for dissemination to council members and staff would have been late last year, I think, that outlines the different gift disclosure obligations. And we can certainly redistribute the same. Um, I'm not sure, well, I don't recall having previously discussed with council members whether there is an appetite on council for a general prohibition of gifts generally from a certain class um, or category of individuals, like developers or sporting groups or charities or otherwise. Um, but administration's happy, obviously, to take guidance from council members on, um, on what council's position on that might be. But I would simply encourage that um, they, that be considered in light of the gift disclosure provisions that already apply under the legislation. Nothing further? OK. Um, council members? I've got a couple of questions then. I just also, I just wanted to query um, in the um, response to uh, Welga, it does say that our position is that we don't support training for candidates prior to standing, given that it might um, discourage. But I thought that perhaps I'd just like a little bit more information on what level of training. For example, we're talking about a, a jump online and do a, an e-learning 
type scenario because there's some merit in um, providing people, well, um, the question is, could we get a little bit more information around what level of training is, um, is being considered and if it was something quite, you know, like there'd be a span, I imagine, with something being quite simple and accessible versus something that requires, say, an attendance at a certain place which may require a high level of commitment to, say, an e-learning module, for example. Um, yes, uh, the, the WALGA submission is, um, is quite straightforward in that it just says they, they're... Um, they will be opposed to any mandatory training. So it's then up to the, the city to uh, spell that out. If we think that a, a certain type of training um, is desirable, then we can spell that out in our submission. I mean, it would be nice for candidates to actually understand what it is that local government does, but... <laughs> yes. Yes. So I might, I mean, I might just to have a further discussion around that with you during the week because I think there's a potential for something. Um, in relation to standing down when standing for election at a, another tier of government, we, I just wanted to know at, w at which point, because there's various stages during, um, for example, the state election process has an issuing of the writs, which is sort of day one, and then at, say, day 10 of the process, there's a close of nominations. Um, can we be more specific about at what point it is that we believe a person should stand down? Um, yes, we can. So the Walga position is that it's from the issue of writs. Um, it's obviously up to the city if we um, think a different time period is appropriate. That's something perhaps for discussion. Um, and in terms of recommendations, I note that we talk about including payment or being able to make payments to external members on audit committees, but I couldn't see in there that we would recommend that external audit committee members are included as a um, recommendation to WELGA. So there's talk about pay, uh, allowing for payments to be made, but should we be actually saying that we um, support external members um, being um, participating in audit committees? Um, certainly that can be added and will be added for next time. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Moving on from corporate services to CEO, we have the information bulletin. Is there any questions on the information bulletin? Councillor Loden. Uh, just on the development services um, applications, I saw that we um, had 40 applications lodged and 29 determined. And if you look at the data, we seem to be processing about 25 to 30 um, a month. So I'm just wondering if um, that, if that's the trend, if we seem to be heading in the wrong direction rather than the right direction. So I just wanted to seek some clarity on those figures. Um, through the chair, the applications, the city's finalised um, all of its recruitment of its planning staff. Um, they started, um, we've got a full contingent um, of staff which started uh, two weeks ago. Um, so we're expecting over the coming months of that trend to change um, given we've got everybody on board. Anything further on the information bulletin? Okay, we'll move to item 9.2, late report, approval of council briefing and council meeting dates for 2018. Any questions on this item? Um, before we move on from this item, I just did want to highlight, um, it's not coming up for me as a late item. But I did just want to highlight, perhaps, um, CEO, do you have the dates there? Thank you. Um, just because of the way in which the dates fall and because we have Easter, I um, just wanted to highlight that the dates around 
Tuesday the 27th of March and Wednesday we've actually looked at holding the council meeting on the Wednesday the 4th of April so that it doesn't fall on the immediate Tuesday following on from Easter in order to allow time for community members to to respond or for us to seek information from administration so just wanted to highlight that it follows the standard pattern other than to accommodate Easter in that way. Okay, thank you. Um, well, that concludes the, um, the standard agenda and the only item remaining to um, ask questions on is a confidential item. So at this moment we will um, request that uh, we move to deal with that confidential item and we'll just ask staff and media to um, we'll say goodnight and we'll say goodnight to those web streaming from home. So thank you. <laughs>